Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott. Happy New Year to all of you, and today we are going to jump into one of our early reviews for 2024, and that is of the E-mount version of the Viltrox Pro AF 27mm f1.2. Now, like the E-mount version of the 75mm f1.2, with that lens, I expected a straight across port. It first came out on Fuji X mount, and my experience is with lenses that release on multiple mounts that it's basically the same lens that is just ported over for different lens mounts. That's not what Viltrox did with the 75 millimeter f1.2. Instead, we got a lens that surprisingly had a number of additional features on E-mount, and that's true here with the 27 millimeter f1.2. It has core upgrades like an AF-MF switch, a focus hold or custom button, and it even has a D-click option for the aperture iris. One of the other things that we get as an improvement on Sony is that autofocus is improved largely because not only does Viltrox lenses work a little bit better on Sony, but of course Sony has a more robust autofocus system at this point, particularly when it comes to the fringes that we'll talk about a little bit here today. Now, like on Fuji, this lens has a slightly uh, tighter than 40 millimeter uh, full frame equivalency, making this a really great normal lens. Now, I know a lot of people are programmed to think as 50 millimeters as being kind of that optimal normal range, but having shot a lot of different lenses over my career, obviously at this point, I'm really partial to this particular point of view because it gives you just a little bit wider framing than what 50 millimeter does, so a little bit more flexibility, but when you pair it with a huge maximum aperture of f1.2, it also allows you to get really shallow depth of field results, making it a really versatile lens for a lot of things, from street to capturing family events to shooting portraits, but then also the flexibility to do things like landscapes or some interiors. It still is very, very useful. Now, it's a little bit different of a lens map here on Sony. And truthfully, the Sony equivalents, APS-C specific equivalents, are you know, lenses that tend to be old and expensive. And so when it comes to this Viltrox lens, it's only real disadvantage compared to those lenses is the fact that it is larger and heavier than them, but it also has a much larger maximum aperture and much better image quality. So this lens is a real treat on Sony and we'll dive into all the details of why right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber, and use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So as before with the X-mount version, this lens physically in terms of the, the size and the weight is almost identical. What we do have here is a lens that is 82 millimeters in diameter or 3.22 inches. So compared to the 75 millimeters, it's five millimeters narrower. It is 92 millimeters in length or 3.62 inches, making it nine less millimeters in length compared to the 75 millimeters. And it weighs in at 571 grams or 20 ounces, which is about 110 grams lighter than the 75 millimeter. Now, obviously, particularly when you're talking about that weight, this is not a light lightweight went lens on APS-C and and so you know that is going to be probably your your biggest negatives to take in that this is in some ways a more natural fit on something like my A7R Mark V in APS-C mode but I will note I recently traveled with both this lens and I was doing the review of the A7C which is basically almost identical in size to the Sony A6600, A6700 cameras like that and I will say that I had no issues with carrying it for hiking or doing any number of things. I wasn't using the grip extender because I wanted to travel as light as possible and so you know I shot an APS-C mode on this camera because it gave me also the option of shooting some of the full frame lenses I took along and frankly it worked just fine. Now, your mileage may vary and your tolerance for how much weight you're going to carry is going to obviously vary somewhat, but I will say that it does work. 
Now, obviously, as noted, there are more features here and everything works fine. AF, MF switch, always a treat to have. Having that function button, which you can program to different functions within the camera is very useful. And while we have the same aperture and aperture iris as before, aperture ring, in that we can do one third stop uh, clicks here, you also have the option on the Sony version to declick that aperture for smooth aperture racking for those of you that are inclined towards that. Some extra features that make this lens really, really premium. Now, there is also an 11 bladed aperture iris, which again is more premium than a lot of the alternatives out there. And so this lens is quite a treat in a lot of ways. You have a lot of different looks you can do with the look of the aperture and that wide open, it does have a little bit of a swirl effect, but you stop it down even to say about F1.6 and you can get really circular shapes all across the frame. This is a thoroughly weather sealed lens as well. And so it has, by my estimation, based on the, the Fuji diagram, has 10 seal points, but there are at least three different other potential seal points here because of the button and two extra switches. And so I'm going to guess that there are 13 seal points, though that information has not yet been released by Viltrox. It also has a nano HD coating on the front, similar to a fluorine type coating to help with finger fingerprints, moisture resistance, and things like that. Now the lens hood is included. It is not a particularly shallow lens hood. And I do have a little bit of a complaint here in that it doesn't bayonet super tightly and so it isn't hard to kind of bump it loose. You can hear it clicking there. And so you would feel like it's really locked in, but it just doesn't quite hold as much as what I would like. I also note that everything else here is all metal. It's really, really nicely executed. And the lens hood being plastic just feels a little bit cheaper. That's kind of the nature of the beast. Now the rings themselves move really nicely. The um, manual focus ring, even though it's focused by wire, it has really nice damping and weight. There's no visible stepping or anything like that. So it's actually quite a nice manual focus experience. They have included a USB-C port and so you can do firmware updates to it and that is always very welcome. And Viltrox has proven that they will issue firmware updates and help to continue to improve the performance of their lenses. And as with the X-mount version, we do have a better minimum focus distance. You can focus as closely as 28 centimeters. And so instead of the standard 0.10 we used to get on all Viltrox lenses, you've got a little bit better 0.15 times magnification, which is at least competitive at this point. It means you can get some nice looking close-ups with the lens that just adds to the versatility of it. So again, outside of the size and the weight, this is a beautifully built lens that is basically as premium as anything you're going to find on Sony that is designed for APS-C. It's a really sweet lens. Now autofocus here, as before, is a lead screw type STM motor, but as noted, in my intro, you get a little bit better performance on Sony for, I think, a couple of reasons. You can see from my focus test that either indoors or outdoors, focus speed was really quite nice. I've had the opportunity to shoot with this lens uh, because I traveled with it in a lot of different lighting conditions and focus was always top notch. I mean, focus speed was good even in lower light situations. Uh, and, you know, either indoors or outdoors in low light, it didn't really matter. I was able to get quick autofocus, so no real issue issues there. My eye tracking was typically very, very good, resulting in very good end results. Every now and then it might get thrown just a little bit, but overall IAF was excellent whether shooting in video or shooting in stills. I also found that I was able to track basketball action quite well, even shooting at f1.2, and it delivered just accurately focused results again and again. And so, I mean, that's really, really fantastic, obviously. I found while traveling, part of what I was doing was just being with family for the holidays, that the autofocus worked really well for those kind of critical moments you want to capture in life, you know, photos of family and just the various things that you're doing. It just nailed it and delivered great results. Now, what's a whole lot nicer here on Sony, as opposed to Fuji, is the overall performance when it comes to video. And so the focus pulls were just smoother and more confident because Sony's autofocus for video is 
more confident. And so as a byproduct, I got really nice uh, in my focus pulls test, no pulsing, no hesitation, no visible steps. Likewise, when I did the hand test, it was really, really good and uh, nice, you know, confident transitions from the eye to the hand and vice versa. My only negative in that is that there is some noticeable focus breathing. And so you can feel a little bit of abruptness as you make those focus transitions because there is an obvious amount of breathing that takes place that just kind of pulls you into the movement a little bit more than what I would like. Outside of that, however, I have no really critiques for the autofocus performance. It was excellent on Sony and I shot on multiple cameras. I got good results on all of them. Now, when it comes to the image quality, I will do a detailed image quality breakdown at the end. And so if you want to skip ahead to that to get a more detailed analysis, you're welcome to do so. It is time stamped below. But to break that down, for those of you that want just a quicker overview, uh, we have switched to Hoya optical glass in these lenses, and you can just really tell that there is a very specific point where all of a sudden Viltrox glass just got a lot better, and that's definitely apparent here. You can see from the MTF chart that this is great results, particularly for an f1.2 lens. The fact that the lens already survived the ultimate torture test in anything that I review on Fuji's 40 megapixel sensor means that 26 megapixels on Sony is no problem. Not to mention that Sony files are still a little bit eddier, easier to sharpen and all of that. And so it really delivers a really great image quality result. Now, one thing that I got to test here that I didn't get to test on Fuji is how much of the full frame image circle that it, that it covers. And that's a question that obviously a lot of people are going to have. And so obviously, if, as you look at this, it does not cover the full frame image circle. There are some very obvious hard black mechanical vignette where the image circle is not fully covered. So in kind of testing to see how much wider framing I got, I did get wider than the APS-C crop, but we're probably talking something like six or seven millimeters and uh, not, you know, any kind of anything really significant. Maybe that is worth it to you. It isn't really to me. I'm going to just use this as an APS-C lens. I don't want to have to mess with cropping all the time anyway. Now, as far as other measures, it has minimal distortion, so little that you probably won't even want to correct it in most situations. Vignette is a little bit more obvious. It's required a plus 68 to correct, so over two stops for sure. And so there are situations where I did notice the vignette, and there's other situations where the vignette kind of works, but there are certain situations like shooting here in Ontario in snowy environments where it's obvious, and I don't want to mess with that. And so that will require some correction. There is excellent image quality all across the frame, even at f1.2. And uh, it's it, this is a very high resolving lens, so the center is super sharp, mid frame is very sharp, and corners just lagging a little bit behind there. There is a fairly significant contrast improvement by f1.8, and then throughout the rest of the aperture range, image results are just super sharp. And because diffraction comes a little bit later at 26 megapixels, I found that even at the minimum aperture of f16, results were still, I thought, perfectly usable. And so this is a lens that basically works from f1.2 to f16 here on Sony. The bokeh looks good. As I noted, there's a little bit of a swirly effect that has something to do with very much lemon or cat eye shapes along the edges of the frame. You can stop down to about f1.6 or smaller if you want really round bokeh circles across the frame. That's a priority to you. It has a very high 11 aperture blade count, so it does keep a really nice circular aperture shape. I found in testing for coma that this lens actually did really good for that as well. And it's very crisp with star points and there's not a huge amount of chromatic distortion along the edges of the frame or aberrations. And so it delivered really good results from that. And surprisingly for an f1.2 lens, really flare resistance is quite good here. And so uh, it, particularly wide open, I just get a, a really kind of very slight but artistic veiling effect wide open. And then when stopped down, there's just minor ghosting artifacts not really bad at all. And so in summation, this is an incredible lens that just gets better on Sony. More features, slightly better performance, and uh, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer kind of lens because to me this is a, an incredibly useful focal length and if you're going to get just one prime lens and you can deal with the weight, this is kind of a prime lens to get because you can just use it for so many different things and having that huge maximum aperture of f1.2 just adds to the versatility, gives you just more creative creativity in the kind of shots that you can capture. 
It's a great value at under 550 US dollars, and you can use the code Dustin Abbott if you buy from Viltrox and get an additional 8% off. And so getting that down just a little over $500 makes for a, you know, a, a pretty sweet value for a lens that just does so many things so well. And so if you are comfortable with a slightly larger lens, go get one. This is a fantastic lens. And if you watch my 2023 DA awards, you know that the X mount version of this lens was one of my award getters. And it's even better here on Sony. Now, if you want an even deeper dive into performance, stay tuned and we're going to dive into an image quality breakdown. Now, because Fuji X-Mount is only APS-C, I didn't have the opportunity to test how much of the image circle that this lens would cover for a full frame camera. So this is the APS-C crop on Sony. If we take a look here, you can see that 6240 by 4160. That's the pixel dimensions. And so here is on something like a Sony A7R Mark V, 61 megapixels. This is the full frame image circle. So you can see 9504 by 6336 is the pixel dimensions. Now you can see that on the image circle, so this would be the edge of the frame here. You can see because of the, the ratio. But you can see that there is a significant portion in that those corners that is just not not covered at all and so this is a hard mechanical vignette you're not going to recover that by adding exposure because all the light is being blocked from reaching the sensor so obviously this is not a full frame lens masquerading as an APS-C lens however we can see that you can crop wider than the actual APS-C image circle here if you're so inclined now you can see I there's a little bit of vignette left in the corners. I didn't attempt to correct that, but it's enough that you probably could correct that. But this is what I consider to be kind of a reasonable crop in. So if 6240 on the long end represents the APS-C or Super 35 crop, I was able to leave it as wide as about 7110. Now, if we calculate 7110 by 4740, that has us at a little over 33 megapixels. And so let's getting us into something more like the Sony a7 IV range with its resolution. And so obviously not bad. And you can see that it's definitely wider. There's more in the frame. So, I mean, it's, it's not something I would personally do, but if you want to go there, it is viable, I guess. Now, when it comes to the natural vignette and distortion here, we can see that distortion is nearly non-existent. You could leave this uncorrected and probably never notice it, even if you're shooting a brick wall. However, vignette is definitely noticeable. Now, in this case, I did dial in a plus two to correct the very, very minor amount of distortion if you wanted to mess with that. But vignetting, I've done a plus 68 in the corners and moved the midpoint most of the way over to give an even illumination here. So a little over two stops of vignette in the corner. Now, as you stop the lens down, most of that vignette will naturally dissipate. So here at f1.2 and then at f5.6, no correction on the right side or the left. You can see the vignette is very noticeable, but stop down, it's essentially gone. And up here in the corners and here at the edges, you can just see that everything looks nice and clean. So when it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberrations, we have a very near apochromatic performance here in that you can see there is very little fringing either before or after the plane of focus. And if you don't see it in this kind of setting, you're not gonna see it in many settings. Here, for example, I've taken a shot of an old classic camera here with lots of reflective surfaces and you can see that all the typical places where you would see fringing, I can see just the slightest bit of fringing right there, but you know, and here and here, but it's so minuscule that even at a pixel level, you can scarcely notice it. So this is a really strong performance when it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberrations. Likewise, lateral chromatic aberrations, very well controlled. And here near the edge of the frame on my test chart, uh, you can see that there just isn't any fringing to point to. All the transitions are nice and smooth. Now, the fact that this lens performed well, even on Fuji's extremely demanding 40 megapixel APS-C sensor means that on a lower resolution 26 megapixel Sony sensor, we're not going to have any problems. And so even at 200%, 26 megapixels, we can see that the center of the frame, very crisp. Mid frame looks fantastic. You can see that bit of noir that is uh, developing there. And that I only see that when you have a really high contrast lens. And so that's, that's actually a really positive sign. 
And here in the corners, we can see that right off to the very, very edge of the frame, we actually still have continuing resolution and it's resolving well. If anything, I would say it's actually sharper at the extreme corner than what it is going back about four or five percent. It looks better here than it does here. So that is a really impressive performance. To give you some real world perspective at how this lens performs at wide apertures, you can see here that uh, even this is a more typical 100% magnification. You can just see how all the little fine hairs are really well delineated. It's just really, really beautiful. Uh, this shot here, you can see with skin tones, this is at uh, f1.6, but you can just see how much detail is being rendered by the lens. It is a really fantastically sharp lens. Now something a little bit interesting at f1.2 to f1.4, you can see that the camera metered the same, So though the histogram shows that there is a difference. But what is interesting here is when you look into the corners and you can see that there's actually a considerable amount of vignette lift even at f1.4. So there's a little bit of a pro tip if you, you, you don't want to mess with correcting vignette. You can stop down to f1.4 and actually get considerably less. And so as a byproduct, because vignette is not affecting the, or because it, vignette is affecting the overall metering less, the camera is metering at a similar place, even though the aperture is a little bit smaller. You can also see that there is a little bit of a contrast boost there at f1.4. So that mild bit of stop down does give you a bit of improvement. And obviously it's going to give you brighter corners as we've seen already. Now from f1.4 to f1.8, there is a continued improvement in terms of contrast. You can see that there's just a little bit more punch there. And uh, you can see that in the mid frame as well, which just looks a little bit crisper still. And then down into the corners where the corners are looking number one a whole lot brighter you can also see there's just more contrast just between the dark areas and the light areas at f2 and then at f2.8 we can just see continued improvements this lens is just now just at f2.8 it is just mind-blowingly sharp in the center of the frame we come down here amazingly crisp with great contrast right off to the edge of the frame looking great there we'll take a quick look at centering and you can see it looks great up in the upper left and up into the upper right. We've already seen the lower right well centered. Filtrox is, in my opinion, really starting to nail quality control as well. And I just see a really consistent performance out of their lenses. Now, as we stop the lens on down, I've got f8 on the left and then f16 on the right. And we can see that while diffraction is starting to diminish the results to where the contrast isn't as good as we see f8 compared to f16, which is minimum aperture on the right, we can see that contrast is reduced a little bit, but we can also see that it's still perfectly usable. And so this is a lens that at least on Sony, because of the lower resolution point, so I would actually consider this to be perfectly usable all throughout the aperture range. Now, one key thing that Viltrox has finally started to improve in is improving their minimum focus distance and thus maximum magnification. And we can see here that this lens has a magnification of 0.15 times. Uh, contrast still looks good in the center of the frame. I think it's reduced just a little bit. There's just a little bit more haze at minimum focus distance, but overall, it's still very good. And so as a byproduct, you can get higher magnification, but here in real world use, that contrast still looks very, very good. And because there's not a lot of fringing there, even on something like highly reflective like this with lots of potential for it, it just gives me a lot of room for doing up close type shots. Here I stop down to F2 and you can see magnification is high, but that detail there is just exquisite and so it you know makes the lens all the more flexible now often when you have a lens that has this high of a level of detail and contrast the bokeh suffers fortunately in this case i think that viltrox has struck a pretty nice balance and this image you know it's got that great detail there but the bokeh even with a lot of potential busy areas really looks quite good now, as talked about previously, there is definitely some cat eye or lemon shape that produces almost a swirly effect at f1.2, but for many people, that can actually be a desirable effect, and if you don't like it, you just stop down the lens a little bit, as we'll see in a moment, and that goes away. But you can see here at f1.2, that ability to use bokeh and depth of field to really create unique images. Uh, for portraiture here, we can see that we've got good detail on my daughter's face, but you can see that the bokeh behind looks you know really interesting and so here you can see at f1.2 kind of that the cat eye effect towards the edge however if i stop down for another shot this is only at f1.6 you can see already that we have circular shapes almost per 
completely perfect. It's not quite perfect yet, but almost perfect right up to the very edge of the frame. Now, that Hoya opti optical glass in these lenses has really made a difference when it comes to the overall colors. I used to find Viltrox colors just a little bit garish and unnatural. I'm really impressed with the improvement now. Colors are really rich. This is Fountain Hills, Arizona, a beautiful spot. And so, uh, you know, in that 11-bladed aperture here, you know, to be able to capture that in the Saguaro and to get that really cool effect there. Here's another shot of the desert at sun sunset and you can see just the colors are really beautiful and rich here back in Ontario you can see that while the scene's a little more wintry you can see that the colors are natural and they look good for something like street here's a great example of all of the things we've just talked about and so getting up close great detail that's there but the bokeh here is really creamy due to that huge maximum aperture and the colors look really really rich and so impressive now, when it comes to coma and shooting the night sky, obviously a lens with a maximum aperture of f1.2 is very interesting for that, particularly one that's really sharp. And so you can see we don't have any fringing around the really bright night sky points. So that's very useful. And you can also see looking right to the very edge of the frame, there is very, very little coma that is there. And so Viltrox has done something that's pretty rare, and that has created a huge maximum aperture lens that manages to handle something like this really nicely with very minimal coma. So this is obviously outside of the vignette, which is correctable. This is a very tempting lens for shooting Astro with. Finally, when it comes to flare resistance, the lens is not perfect, but for a large aperture lens, it is very good. And so here at f11, you can see the sunburst effect, but you can also see that either in the primary source of the sun and in the reflected areas, it has an affected contrast. Likewise, here at a larger maximum aperture, we can see that you know it's less defined in terms of the blades, but again, we're holding up really well in terms of contrast. Overall, this is a really, really strong performance. I, from top to bottom, I'm extremely impressed. So if you made it to the end, thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.